two months ago. I told you that I was finished with this case. I meant it then, and I mean it now. I'm finished. Come in, doctor. Come in. Come in. Come in. Come in. Come in. I'm sorry. But I'm off the case. And I don't want to argue about it. I've heard everything you had to say. And I don't want to talk about it anymore. I just want to tell you that I'm finished, and that's it. What happened now? Nothing's happened now. Obviously, something has. No, nothing's happened. Nothing's happened now. It hasn't been happening for the past seven and a half months. I'm not sure why I'm so calm this morning, but at any rate, uh, if I go on with this kid, doctor, he's going to have me running up wolves. I tell you time and time and time again, I bring him to the point of contact where I think I can do something with him. And every single time I run into this hatred. Now, the boy hates me. You don't understand how deeply he hates me. I understand. That's his problem. Oh, I know it's his problem. Believe me, I know that. But you've got 14 psychiatrists on this staff, and two of them are Negroes, and one of them should be down there with that boy and not me, and you know that as well as I do. The boy is 13 years old. His mother was a prostitute who brought home white men. His father was hanged by white men for killing one of the white men that his mother brought home, and your reasoning, and God only knows, I respect you, and I respect your experience, but doctor, in this case, your reasoning is wrong, dead wrong. It's not wrong. I spoke with the patient last week. In my judgment, it is absolutely essential, having undertaken this case, that you see it through. Don't you think I know that? What in the hell do you think has been keeping me going on this case for seven and a half months without getting anywhere? Easy. I'm sorry. But this boy's got me over a barrel in a way that I don't eat. I just don't eat. And I haven't slept. I don't remember the last time I've been able to sleep. And I, I feel like hell. I, uh... You have a job to do. I never heard anyone describe it as an easy one. No. No! No, if failing with that boy means that I failed on this job, then I failed, and that's it. But you're going to take me off this case as of now. I suppose I don't remove you from the case. Well, then I'm through. And I mean that. And I don't care. You're really serious, aren't you? I'm sorry, doctor, that I've gotten excited. But I just can't handle it. I'm serious. You know, I thought for quite a while about putting Smith or Harris on this case because they are Negroes. But I didn't. For just one reason. I have more confidence in you than in either one of them. They're good, but they're not quite as good as you are. And I do understand how you feel. I do understand how you feel. I quit my job one time. And it was the first really good job I ever had. Prison psychiatrist in a federal penitentiary. that had me over a barrel came in in 1942. 29 years old, Caucasian, and sentenced to three years for sedition. Okay, whatever you say, Doc. See you tomorrow. I was working on 40 or 50 cases at the time, and it was 20 years ago. All right. But I remember, I remember the time he walked into my office as if it were yesterday. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> no, on second thought, that's a good idea. Keep laughing. Just stand there and keep laughing. Downstairs, you don't like answering questions. You got a job to do, go ahead and do it. Exactly what do you think my job is? 
What do you think I think? I'm not insane if that's what you're trying to find out. According to the information I have here, you've done some mighty strange things. That's your opinion. Do you really believe all those things you've been doing and saying? You really do, don't you? Not to go to jail for them, anyway. If a man isn't willing to take some risk for what he believes in, why, uh, either his opinions are no good or he's no good. Which is it with you? Look, let's not get personal. Are you, uh... A doctor, or aren't you? My job is to find out exactly... I don't care what your job is. I don't even care what you think. Why not? Because you're a Negro. So finish asking your questions, let me get out of here. You can go any time you like. But before you go, tell me, what have you got against us Negroes? You really want to know? I really want to know. What do you got against us whites? There's your answer. Now that the Jews put that cripple in the White House, you people think you got it made, don't you? I suppose so. got me in here, there's nothing I can do about that. You can ask me all the questions you want. You can even write down that I'm crazy. But you can't keep me in here forever. I don't know about that. It shouldn't be too difficult to get you committed when your sentence expires. After all, I've got it made. And since they've got that cripple in the White House, it should be easy to get a couple of my colleagues a couple of Jew psychiatrists to certify you insane. You're trying to needle me, huh? Just trying to get to know you. Tell me, do you really feel what you do? What do you mean? What you say about the government and Jews and Negroes? Most of it. And the rest? Politics. And you really expect to win like that? After all, look what it's gotten you so far. Well, that was a predictable setback, I'd say. After all, Hitler had his. He wrote Mein Kampf in prison, you know. You intend to write your memoirs? Maybe. Maybe. What do you expect to do when you get out? Same thing I did before. Advocate the violent overthrow of the government. Not necessarily violent. It'll depend on the American people. In the meantime, I plan to read and prepare myself for the future. I understand you have a marvelous library here. I was somewhat ashamed of the way I had conducted that first interview. I certainly did not feel I had been objective. I had to admit to myself that I was disappointed when I found that he was to be confined for a relatively short time. For everything about the man, everything he believed and stood for, alienated me, repelled me. Curious, I thought, how detached and even tolerant I could be with the murderers and thieves I saw and treated every day, but with him. Well, any more questions? I see you're uh, studying. Well, go ahead. How about a closer look? Maybe you want me to take my clothes off. More on the basis of his history than on the interview, I decided he was a psychopathic personality. He was paranoid, aggressive, antisocial. And because he was a leader type, he might easily become a focal point for the impressionable inmates. I recommended that he be quartered by himself under maximum security precautions to prevent him from spreading his ideas.
Round we go. Right. Let it go. Let it go. I'll give you a good reason for not liking shoes. trouble ever since he got here. Well, I'm not surprised. I just had a brief talk with him, but that was enough. How would you like to have a longer talk with him? Frankly, I wouldn't. I don't think I could be of help right now. Why not? There's little I could do unless I get complete cooperation, and he didn't seem very cooperative to me. What do you expect us to do with him? I don't know. Look, let's just wait a while and see what happens. But if there's any more trouble, I'm afraid you'll be stuck with him. How's that? Thanks a lot. <laughs> That's the spirit. Keep smiling, I always say. Yeah, well, whatever you always say. <laughs> I'll see you later. Okay. Hey, Wilbur. It doesn't seem to be anything physically wrong. All I know is I can't sleep for the past week. I've been on the... Keep breathing deeply. Can't you give me some sleeping pills? Not unless I find some reason for it. All right, you can put your shirt back on. What am I going to do then? If you can't sleep, there must be some reason for it. Right? I suppose so. Well, that's what we're going to find out. Take your time. What can I do for you? Look, I didn't ask to come up here, so let's not play any games. Your answers are probably on those cards anyway. What I've learned from this is that there's nothing organically wrong with you. That you have occasional blackout spells. And that you find it difficult to fall asleep. That's enough, isn't it? What's that what can I do for your routine? I didn't ask you what was wrong with you. I wanted to know if you thought I could help you. If you'd let me help you. Help me, huh? Look who's calling the kettle black. Who ever heard of a Negro psychiatrist anyway? Don't you people have enough troubles? Boy, you must be a real masochist. Why can't a Negro be a psychiatrist? Well, he can. <laughs> yeah, he can. But where's he gonna get his patients outside of a federal penitentiary? Psychiatry is an expensive thing, and your people can't afford it, you know. So the best you can be is a prison psychiatrist in the worst office they've got. You want to help me? Why don't you just help yourself? What do you mean? This isn't the place for you. All you people are trying to be white and respectable. You want to be doctors, psychiatrists. Why don't you wise up? How would I do that? Go back to Africa. 
about those black eyes spells? What about them? Can you describe them? Look, I just want to sleep now. Can't you give me some pill or something? You were sent to me because the physicians downstairs didn't think it was medicine you needed. Really? What do they think you can do? That depends on how willing you are to cooperate with me. For example, when I ask you something, I don't do it to pry, but because I need the information to help you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I know what psychiatry is. Then you should let me try to help you sleep. Okay, doctor. You go ahead and you make me sleep. Can you describe those black eye spells? I suppose I can try. Well, try. Well, at first, get a little sick to my stomach. And then suddenly I feel like something's coming down at me and I can't breathe and I can't see. Then it's over. What? What is that something? I don't know. Do you ever have any nightmares when you do sleep? Look, I just want to sleep. When you have these spells, do you ever feel as if you're going to fall? No. Have you ever fainted in your life? Once. When? When I was a kid. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I ain't answered none of your spooky questions. Do you feel unusually good or unusually bad a day or so before an attack? During an attack, do you feel strange sensations in some parts of the body accompanied by flashes of light or color with strange sounds? Do you feel your legs and body stiffen? Do you feel as if your breathing has stopped? See, I had the same thing once. Can you help me? I don't know. I'll have to know more about you. After several extremely slow and difficult months of analysis, there finally came a knowledge, a beginning. He was an only child. And his conception, he soon found out, was the only cause for the sudden and bitter marriage that followed. His father was a butcher. He was quick to anger and hard to please. His vigor, it seemed, was constantly replenished by drink and by vengeful resentment he felt toward his son. myself I wouldn't cry. Why not? Because I didn't want to be like her. His mother was a weak and sickly woman. 
Soon after the birth of her son, unable to take the strain of her husband's abuse, she began to spend most of her time in bed, from where she would fill the house with her groans and complaints. As far back as he could remember, he had reluctantly been the sole object of her affections. How long is this going to take, anyway? I just want to sleep. That's all I want to do is sleep. You may leave any time you like. Within a few years after his parents had moved into a new middle-class neighborhood, he had learned to play by himself. The mothers in the neighborhood had cautioned their children not to play with him. And he, in turn, as a defense, pretended that his loneliness was something special and of his own making. It wasn't. It was due to his father, who had by then become something of a legend in the district. His drunken ritual was known to all who were within hearing distance as he came home late, singing raucously and swearing obscenities. What's the What's your matter? Yes, <laughs> man! seemed to know what to do. But the funny part of it was, I never really felt sorry for her. Why didn't you? I don't know. Don't you feel sorry for people who are weak? Guess I don't. Why not? Why should I? They're the first ones to resent pity anyway. As a matter of fact, I admire a weak man who competes. Because a weak man who competes becomes a strong man. Stronger, in fact, because he has to overcome all the odds against him. Do you really believe that? Don't you? It's a funny question coming from a Negro. Why do you say that? Do you think of Negroes as weak men, competing against all odds? Well, do you? Well, I don't think of them as inferior, if that's what you're trying to imply. You don't? Not where they belong. Not in Africa. I see. But here, you think they are inferior. That's right. But you admire them for competing. You just said so. <laughs> okay, if you want to look at it that way, yes. I suppose you feel the same way about Jews. 
Yeah, in a more subtle way. What do you mean? Well, they're more dangerous. Why? Because they pass for white, and they're smarter. You use the word dangerous. Exactly what is endangered? The purity of the white Christian stock. Tell me, when you were a child, did you know any Negroes or Jews? Well, I didn't know any Negroes. I'm sure of that. I'm not so sure about the Jews, though. But uh, I didn't have many friends when I was a kid, anyway. Didn't you have any friends? Sure I did. Cut off from ordinary social contacts and forced in upon himself at an early age, he subsequently developed an imaginary playmate. With this creature of his own making, he strove to achieve some of the satisfactions which were denied him in reality. Satisfactions that weren't always proper, yet sharply revealing. Play my shoes. Clean my shoes. I said clean my shoes. Let's play. One, two, three. Are you my friend? You gonna listen to me? No matter what I tell you to do, are you going to listen to me? Or your father? If I tell you something and your father tells you something, who are you going to listen to first? I don't believe you. You're lying. Come over here by me. Right here. Soon after he began school, his playmate died. Not all at once, of course, but slowly dissolving into the fog of memory where forgotten things disappear. In school, he drew attention to himself as a leader of daring recklessness, followed by new playmates gathered from the undisciplined element to wage the small anarchistic war he conducted against the school authorities. And yet, despite his attitude, he progressed in his schoolwork. He had an alert and facile mind, nourished by a surprising gift for immediate concentration, 
and had his conduct been closer to average, he probably would have been his school's prize scholar. It just dropped out of my hands. I shouldn't have gotten up. I'm sorry. Help me back. I'd help her then. Then she'd start in again with her complaints. I'm shivering. I'm really cold. It isn't cold in here, is it? Why do I feel so cold? I wouldn't answer her most of the time. I want to go pick up the cherries. But she'd want to kiss me first. You're the only one. The only one. Then, of course, she'd have it again, her cramp. Always the same place. And she'd start to beg again. Please. Please help me. Please. be all right. That's better. You're such a strong little boy, and you have such strong hands. And she'd go on and on. I don't know how you do it. Oh, yeah. You're the only one. The only one. The only one. Eventually, he began to spend most of his time in vengeful daydreaming. Out of voracious and romantic reading, he constructed gory fantasies in which he got even with everybody. His favorite daydream was the one in which he fancied himself an Eastern potentate. particular fantasy, two features are most interesting. First, it set the pattern for his sexual life. Through the brute aggressiveness with which he fulfilled his desires and imposed his will on others, irrespective of their wishes. The second was paradoxical, for in reality he could not stand the sight of blood with which his fantasies were filled. It meant his father and his father's trade. During vacations and after school, he sometimes would have to help out in the shop where he was put in charge of the cash register since he was dexterous and quick with figures. But he was filled with apprehension if he had to touch or even look at the meat and to watch his father prepare it was literally unbearable for him. His father, knowing this, would occasionally taunt him about it until on a particularly busy day, he asked him to cut up a piece of liver. By the time he was 15, he 
had left home never to return again. I didn't say goodbye. I didn't take any clothes except for what I was wearing. Just took off. Where did you go? Here, there, everywhere, I guess. Just roamed around working at all sorts of odd jobs. Anything I could get, I took. Sounds pretty rough for a boy that age. Believe me, it was. Some of the things I had to do weren't fit for a white man. Sorry, well, what I meant to say was that... It's all right, go on. Look, I said I was sorry. What do you expect me to do, smile? Let's not make a thing out of it. You can appreciate the fact that I apologized. I do, I do, but you make it sound like an achievement. It is for me. Look, you want to go on with this? Sure. Why not? It's a great pastime. It is obvious you think I'm hypersensitive about my color. It's also obvious you think you could hurt me by it. Well, let me fill you in. I'm a doctor. I'm here to help you. You want help? Fine. You don't want help? Take off. Those are the rules. You take them or leave them. I've worked with guys who are sadistic killers who are more human than this guy. Well, take it easy. Take it easy. Take it easy. You can afford to be objective. I know. It's easy to become personally involved in a case like this. That's right. That's why I say I shouldn't handle it. Believe me, I have tried to be objective. I don't think you have. For instance, you can't take his needling, although it's one of his symptoms. Maybe I just can't handle it. Look, ever since you started here, you've proved me right. I grant you, I felt I was fighting a noble cause when I insisted on hiring you. You're a good man. You had a good record. I liked the way you spoke. But underneath, I wasn't so sure. Apart from taking the responsibility of giving the job to a Negro, I couldn't dismiss the possibility that I could have been wrong, that you might not live up to my expectations, which could have been unpleasant for both of us. But you did. Not only did you justify my expectations, but you surpassed them. Yes, you did. The staff feels the same way. Now, don't tell me you're going to let me down. Just because you're a Negro is what he didn't say. And just before the Depression, I got a job as a hard carrier with a traveling construction crew. It was rough, but it was the best job I ever had. How old were you then? Old enough, but none of them knew how young I really was. They just knew I was smart. After a while, they started listening to me, and eventually they even obeyed me. We were a hell of a crew. <laughs> we had some fights, yeah, but sometimes some very funny things happen. Like what? Well, funny things. You know what tic-tac-toe is? It's a game, isn't it? Did you ever play it? When I was a kid. We played it once. But I mean, really played it. What do you mean, really played it? Well, you'd have to understand how it was. See, we'd been in this one town for about two weeks, and this particular night was our last night in the place. Anyway, we were working until our backs were broken and our arms were falling off. It was a crummy little speakeasy outside a nothing town full of nothing people in the middle of nowhere. It was run by a little guy and his wife. And he said it was his wife, but I think she was making more money than he was. They were nothing. 
You know what I mean. Uh, nothing people. Anyway, it was our last night, and we started drinking early, knowing we'd never see the place again. Hey, quit that. That's a bar. Hey, you want to play? I'll give you some paper. Come on, play with me. You're getting soft. What you need is some exercise. That's it, I'm gonna give everybody some exercises. <laughs> I'm gonna give your husband some exercises. You wanna play, Pete? Are you crazy? You're ruining that bar. You know how much that bar cost me? You just stand there and be quiet and make sure Pete don't cheat. You were the umpire. And you, you're the umpire's wife. What are you gonna do? I'm gonna play uh, tic tac toe. Close your eyes. Everybody closes his eyes when he goes to sleep. And you can thank your smart lady for my being so nice.
Turn around a minute. <laughs> in all those many months, there had been times when I was uneasy, times when I was repelled. But that was the point at which I became frightened. And the really frightening thing was that I wasn't sure just what I was frightened of. <laughs> we took that door to everything. Have you ever had a girl? Are you kidding? I mean a steady girl. Not for long. What I mean is, have you ever had a meaningful emotional experience with a woman that wasn't entirely physical? Yeah, once, kinda. What do you mean, kinda? Well, around the time of the Depression, I met someone. Were you working then? No. Uh, the whole crew had to break up. There was no work. No construction, no nothing. Anyway, I wound up in the city, and uh, that was no improvement. How'd you manage that? Guess. Not selling apples. Yeah, I was selling all right, but they weren't buying. Not much, anyway. What about the girl? That's where I met her. Right there in the street? Yeah. She wanted some apples. But you know, I think she felt sorry for me or something. Because after I filled up one bag, she asked for another. And then another. She bought all I had. Just like that, without hesitation. I didn't have a large bag, so I had to put the whole thing in four smaller ones. She was awful nice. Very polite. It looked like she was going to need some help, so I offered her some. She didn't live very far. On the way, we talked about apples and how good they are for you and all that. She seemed really interested in what I was talking about. As if everything I said was something important. And you know, I even made her laugh. But suddenly, we were there, in front of her house. I carried the apples in for her. It was one of those brownstones, you know. But this one was all clean and painted white. My father was in the living room. She introduced me from the hallway. And then she asked me to wait while she took the apples into the kitchen. I just stood there looking around, enjoying the warmth. You should have seen the place. Painting, chandeliers, carved wood furnishing. It looked just like a picture out of one of those high-class magazines. <laughs> You'd never know there was a depression outside. Anyway, she came back from the kitchen looking into her bag. I suddenly realized she asked me to wait because she wanted to tip me. I just couldn't take it. I'd never met anybody that kind before. Or since. 
The next day was really freezing, and the man selling roasted chestnuts next to me, he was really in business. Suddenly, I saw her in the small crowd surrounding him. She had just bought a large cone when she saw me. She saw me and smiled. She didn't just smile. She came over and offered me some chestnuts. We just stood there behind my apples, eating chestnuts, and smiling, looking at each other. All of a sudden, she saw something across the street. It was her father. He must have been passing by. He sure looked mad. He called out to her, but she didn't move. She stood right by my side. Her father then turned and walked away, furious, down the street. She didn't seem to care. She kept on looking right into my eyes. But I mean right into him. And then she simply asked me if I liked her. I didn't know what to say. I just nodded. She said if I would shave and look as neat as I could, she'd be happy if I would call on her that evening at 8 o'clock. That is, if I'd care to. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. I wanted to thank her, but I just nodded. And before I realized it, she was gone down the street in the same direction her father took. I couldn't understand why she would be interested in a bum like me. But I shaved and I tried to look as neat as I could. And at 8 that evening, I was knocking at her door. I waited for some time. And then I heard some voices arguing inside. Suddenly, the door opened. She was just about to say something when her father appeared between us and made it very clear that I wasn't good enough for her. Very clear. When did you join the Nazi party? I never joined the Nazi party. Well, the Bund, or whatever you call it. It's called the German-American Bund. Look, what does this have to do with my being unable to sleep? I don't know. Why? The depression? For who? For the oppressed? For you? For me? For millions of other good white Christian Americans? Yes. But... But is it depressing for everybody? Is it depressing for them? their money, they feel they're the chosen ones. You can see it when they drive down the street in their long cars on their way to the International Bank. Oh, they think they're the chosen ones, all right. With their fat wives in fur coats. Fur coats? Well, they have to keep warm, don't they? It's been a cold winter. They don't have to tell us that. What do they have to tell us? What do they try to tell us? They're trying to tell us to crucify him. They're telling us to take the nails and crucify him. By the power and the glory, haven't they done enough? Crucify him? Why? Because they're afraid of him. They're afraid of us. Crucify him? I say salute him. Salute him! He's the one who'll save us from those who own the banks, who own the newspapers, who own the White House. Because I am not one of the chosen. I say, salute Adolf Hitler! At that point, I knew that my primary concern was not with the welfare of my patient, 
but with the question of whether he was making any sense and how many people there were in this world to whom he would make sense. For although psychopaths are a small minority, it seems significant that whenever militant and organized hate exists, a psychopath is the leader. And if, for instance, 100 disgruntled and frustrated individuals fall in line behind one psychopath, then in essence we are concerned with the actions of 101 psychopaths. Assuming that it has no direct bearing on your problem, are you embarrassed talking about your subversive activities? Look, first, I've never done anything I've been ashamed of. And second, as far as I'm concerned, I've only done what I believe was right. Now, that in my book can't be called subversive. It's a cause, just like any other. I don't expect you to understand. Being a Negro, you're biased. But you take the ordinary man. <laughs> now, he's lost. He has no real leader. He wants a leader. He wants a lot of things he doesn't have and doesn't know how to get. But most of all, he wants an excuse to get them. A cause. And that's where you come in. No. No, that's where you come in. No offense intended. You see, we need you. Where there's no definite enemy, why we create one. People need one to blame things on. So you see, you're the secret weapon. You're the cause to unite against. And you and the Jews, more than anybody else, will be responsible for our triumph. And just how do you intend to bring about this triumph? With people. Take 10 people who believe in your cause. Five of those bring a friend. Now there are 15. They chip in, get a little hall, do a little public speaking. Now out of, say, 100 people, 20 come over and ask questions. Suddenly you're 35. 35 dues-paying people. Now those 35 dues-paying people bring friends. And their friends bring friends. Some don't have any jobs, so you tell them why they don't have any jobs and why their kids are hungry. Then they bring their kids, and their kids are beautiful. And you love their kids, and you hate those chosen few who don't. And soon you create interest, and interest draws people, and people bring money, and money means a little organization. And there you are. It gives you power, and power creates fear. And fear creates hate. And hate creates the enemy, and the enemy fights back. Fighting back creates more interest. Yeah, right here, ladies and gentlemen, right here. Sit it right here. Right here. Believe me, if it wasn't for the war, we'd be running things right now. Make it sound so easy. Go ahead and laugh. Laugh and you won't hear us coming. <laughs> found many who believed in your cause? With the help of a syndicated columnist, among others. He won us the support of certain industrialists, ranging from Detroit manufacturers to giant oil corporations. We even got some movie people from Hollywood on our side. Before you knew it, we were buying radio time. We had youth camps throughout the country teaching American boys and girls of German descent the qualities of leadership. We even sent some of them to Germany to get acquainted. Mein Kampf was required reading in every camp.
thought it interesting that the man who could not stand blood now screamed for it. His screams were effective, too, for his standards of hate and glorification of the brutal drew economic, social, and psychological frustrates by the score. thing is going. Well, you're not moving anywhere right now in particular, are you? Are you kidding? So they stick me in here. Listen, there were 18,000 people in Madison Square Garden the night I told you about. Okay, they grabbed 100 of them and threw them in jail. What do you think the other 17,900 are doing? Right this minute. And you think this thing can be stopped? That we can be stopped? Yes. Well, how? How are you going to stop us? Well, you're stopped, aren't you? At least temporarily. And they will be stopped, because everything you're driving for is founded on a lie. A lie, huh? Now, look, uh, can you be objective for a minute? I know you're handicapped, but are you capable of being really objective? Sometimes. Good, because I want to tell you something. No, in fact, I'm going to show you something. All right, you say we won't get anywhere because what we're doing is founded on a lie. Now, everybody talks about Hitler and the big lies if it was a brand new invention, huh? But tell me something. Where are you going to find a bigger lie than the one this country's founded on? All men are created equal. Everything this country's supposed to live by, right? You personally. As far as you're concerned, Joe Miller could have written the Bill of Rights. <laughs> That's even funnier. What do you got? What can you do? Can you walk on a bus or a streetcar or a train and sit down with a little dignity like a free human being, like a free man? You want to go see a movie, can you walk in just any theater? Some flapjacks cooking in a window can say, hey, I'll have some of those flapjacks. You're a Negro with some brains. You could use a little education. Can you go to the school where you get it best? Maybe you see a house you like, and you've even got the money to buy it. Can you live there? Huh? You live in a ghetto. North, east, south, or west, you live where they let you live. In Harlem, USA. Now, maybe you're good at some job. Can you go to work where you can make something out of it? Can you do any of those things, doctor? And how about your kids? Are your kids going to do any of those things? Maybe. Maybe, huh? <laughs> sure they will. Oh, yeah. In about 5,500 years. Have they got you so beat, doctor, that you don't know when somebody's making sense? Well, you'd have been in Madison Square Garden if it wasn't for the fact that you're black. Now, you hypnotize me, huh? Well, they got you hypnotized. They got you so mixed up, you're singing my country tears of thee while they walk all over you. Right then and there, I knew what I was frightened of. Fortunately, soon after the start of the war, he, among others, was arrested for advocating the violent overthrow of the United States government. just about to go under, something happens, and suddenly you're wide awake again. Can you tell me what stops you? What happens? It's just like the feeling I get when I'm going to have one of those spells. I get drowsy and sleepy, and then I get so frightened. Why are you frightened? I feel like I'm going to die. Why do you feel you're going to die? I don't know. Is there an image, a mental picture? Yes. Is it the body in the sink you told me about? Yes. Whose body is it? I don't know. Whose body could it be? I don't know. You must know. I don't! You mean it has no face? Uh -huh. Who is it? Who is it?
exactly what happened. You know, it was just like all the other times. This was not like the other times. You never had any attacks, did you? What difference does it make? You're trying to avoid my question. You, you lied to me. You know it is, don't you? Who? The body in the sink. Who is it? Who is it? My father. Was the image of your father in every attack? No. No, before I saw myself in the sink. Why didn't you tell me that? I don't know. Did you ever want to kill your father? When I was a kid, I used to lie awake at night praying he would die. And when he didn't, I'd think of ways to do it myself. Pick him up and put him on the counter. And chop him up. And chop him up. And chop him up. I used to treat my mama. I couldn't help thinking, even at that moment, there must be a million people in the world with similar background, with just as bad or worse early childhood, who managed, in spite of it, to become a normal part of society. He hadn't. Do you know why your father's image replaced yours? His image and yours are interchangeable. One image was the desire to kill your father, while the other was punishment for the killing carried out in your fantasies. You were punishing yourself. In other words, you were both the killer and the victim. Once he understood the fantasy that haunted him, and he openly recognized his hatred of his father, the blackout spells that brought him to treatment quickly disappeared. I knew that he needed further treatment. I might have ordered him to submit to it. I didn't. The truth is, I had had all I could stand. He was able to sleep and stopped coming. It took him just one month. Slowly but surely, <clears throat> you've done wonders with him. I don't know what you've done, but ever since you started with him, he's shown the fastest improvement I've seen around here. Doesn't seem like the same man. Thank you, gentlemen. But I don't think I can accept your praise. His conduct has probably improved. And he has no more blackout spells, but otherwise, I don't see much change in him. What do you mean? Well, he's still a Nazi, for instance. Really? He hasn't shown any evidence of that for several months. That's right. And you should take credit for it. Believe me, he still is. Is that why you haven't given him a recommendation for parole? That's right. You're the only one that hasn't, you know. That hasn't what? Given him a recommendation for parole. Really? He's become a model prisoner, according to the guards and his supervisors at work. Really? Well, they are entitled to their opinion. I'm asked for an opinion from a psychological point of view, and according to me, he is not ready for parole. Okay. Assuming that we can't judge him by his behavior, to what extent, then, can we judge his mind? Well, that's for me to decide, isn't it? <laughs> All right. But let me remind you, we're not running a mental institution. For instance, what if his personality remained unchanged, according to you, until his sentence expired? You expect us to keep him here forever? Even then, it would still be my business, wouldn't it? Now, look here. With all due respect to you... You don't understand. This man is dangerous. You don't know him like I... He is dangerous. There's no recent evidence of that. Go ahead. 
it and release it. But don't ask me to share the responsibility. Now, take it easy. Take it easy. Take it easy. That's what they did in Germany. They took it easy. Aren't you taking this a little too personally? How do you mean that? Never mind. Hey, Doc. There's a good chance I might get parole this month. I wouldn't put too much hope on your chances. Why? Well, there's a war on. So? You are an internal enemy. You're going to be asked for a recommendation soon. What are you going to say? What I think. What do you think? That you're not ready for it. You mean you're going to turn me down? I have very little to do with it. All I'm asked for is a statement about you from a psychological point of view. And? I'll have to tell them that I don't think you're ready to go out. But why? I'm all right. Sure, you don't have any more nightmares and you sleep rather well. But your personality is almost the same as when you came in. Well, what's that got to do with it? Everything. Look, please, I've got to get out of here. All I can do is help you to remake yourself. Why don't you remake yourself? I won't interfere with your parole. But when I'm asked, I'll tell them that, in my opinion, your personality remains unchanged. You still have the same rotten ideas and notions you had 18 months ago. <laughs> well, those same ideas and notions are believed in a lot of places by a lot of people. Although I grant you none of them are Negroes. Still, you probably want to remake them all, don't you? You still have the mentality of a stormtrooper. Thank you. I take that as a compliment. They must be pretty smart, those stormtroopers. They own Europe. They took it over just like that. And you know, the funny thing is, the first thing they did was to remake Europe. And how did they do that? By getting rid of certain people. Now, over here, it's going to be a little different. You know it won't only be the Jews we get rid of, don't you? You're going to make it easier for us. You won't have to wear any armband. We're going to spot you a mile away. Wait a minute. I want an apology. You what? You heard me. No, you don't want to get hurt. I said I want you to apologize. What are you going to do if I don't call the hacks? You wouldn't be so brave on the outside. Doctor. I won't call the guards. It's just the two of us. Now, are you going to apologize? All right. I apologize. You know why you apologize? Do you want to know? I refuse to recommend you for parole. You took it as a personal rejection. You felt persecuted as you did when you were a child. And I, like anyone who rejects you, represented your hated father, the person who really rejected you. You wanted to strike back, but I represent an authority. So you were afraid to strike. You decided to hurt me in a different way by attacking me as a Negro. You felt free from any retaliation on my part, as I had put it with in the past. But when I took off my coat, I was no longer a symbol of authority or even of a Negro. Just one person. One man stripped of everything but what he is. 
And to one man, it's easy to apologize, isn't it? We could go over this again tomorrow in detail, if you'd like. Sure, Doc, whatever you say. Hey, where do you think you're going? It's all right, it's over. Is that right, Doc? All right. Next. How's it going? Lousy. Now, look, considering the unusual character of the situation and the possibility of a personality clash, don't you think we should have a discreet talk with the patient? It would clear up any doubts we might have. Doubts? Speak for yourselves, gentlemen. I don't no, know. No, 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 wait. You didn't seem to feel that way earlier at lunch, even though you have taken a personal interest in him from the beginning. All right. You leave me no choice. Hello? Hi. I don't understand you. You know I didn't want to handle this case, but no, you insisted. You practically framed me into it with your faith in me. Well, where's your faith now? Well, it's still there. Really? Well, I'm calling you to enlist your support for my recommendation to deny parole. I'm staking my professional integrity on it. Really, you don't have to. You don't understand. I'm putting my job on the line. Well, I, I don't know what to say. Don't say anything. Just think about it. All right. Now, what about the Jews and the Negroes? Well, what about them? How do you feel about them? Do you mean now or, or when I first got here? Now. I feel I owe them an apology. In other words, you once were prejudiced against them. That's right. How do you account for that? Well, I've changed, thanks to the doctor. And how do you account for him not recommending you for parole? I don't know. When I asked if he would, he flatly refused me. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. What did he say? Well, when he refused, I asked him if he didn't think I'd improve. He admitted to that, but he said I still needed further treatment. Was he specific about why you needed further treatment? No, sir. Some time ago, you stopped going to him. Isn't that right? That's right. Uh, was he the one who ended the sessions? No, I guess I'm the one that stopped coming. You, you see, he helped me a great deal. He explained things to me. He made me understand a dream I was having before every attack. Well, soon after, I stopped having the dream and the attacks. Yet you say he wasn't specific about why he wanted you to continue with him. No. No, he just said that I should be patient with him, and he couldn't tell me what he was working towards. But I should put myself entirely in his hands. Yes? I'd like to talk to you. Oh, come in, come in. This should interest you. I've been asking your patient here a few questions. I think you should hear this. Sit down. He tells us that although you feel he's improved, you want him to continue with analysis. That's right. Why? We've been over this before. Do you know that your patient has only praised for you and what you've done for him? But he also said that you did not tell him specifically why you wanted him to have further treatment. He's lying. Because he has something to hide. I am not lying. I tell you, he's lying. I'm not saying he's not clever. He's about the most clever liar I've ever seen. Well? It's true. I did insult him in the beginning. 
But that was more than a year ago. I never thought you'd hold that against me now. But I think I understand now why you don't want me to get out of here. When I first came in here, I had lots of problems. But I think the doctor's got some problems of his own. I'm not just one person to you, am I? I'm a symbol. A symbol of everything you fear will destroy you. You think I'm your enemy. I've changed, but no matter how much I change, you'll never want me to get out of here. It doesn't matter that I've changed, does it? It's all something purely personal now. Between him and me. Is that trial? Come in. Doctor? What do you want? Well, I'm on my way out, and I asked to see you this morning because... Uh... That's the first I heard that you're on your way out, too. What do you want? Guess I came by to say no hard feelings. I had to do what I did, but I wasn't trying to get you fired. I didn't mean to cost you your job. You didn't. No? Well, then, uh, how come you're leaving? Look, uh, you wouldn't understand, and my... All right, you're sore. You know, I don't blame you for being sore. But you do see how things worked out now, don't you? It's just about how I said it would be, isn't it? I mean, who'd they believe? All those people you've been working with, who they believe? The big black boy who's supposed to be running this place? Or the white Christian American? You clot. You vicious, slimy, rotten little... Let me tell you something. Do you know what I wanted most? Despite what you are and despite what you were, I wanted to help you. I wanted to kill you, and I would enjoy to kill you right now with my bare hands. But more than I wanted to kill you, I wanted to help you. Do you know what that makes me? That makes me more than just a good man. That makes me a doctor. Okay? If you come in here day after day and you spout that stuff about white Christian America, and I took it, I took it because that was my job. Now, let me tell you something. This is my country. This is where I've done what I've done. And if there were a million cuts like you, all sick like you are sick, all shouting down, destroy, degrade. And if there were 20 million more sick enough to listen to them, you are still gonna lose. You're gonna lose, mister, because there is something in this country, something so big, so strong that you don't even know. Something big enough to take it from people like you and come back and nail you into the ground. You're walking out of here, you are going nowhere. Now get out! Get out! What happened to him, you know? Yes. He was hanged about 10 years later for beating an old man to death in the streets, a complete stranger. Now, I'm not saying that that case was as difficult as the one you're dealing with, but I am saying that it put me under as much pressure as you're under right now. And I didn't quit. I know how I'm going to whip this case. I'm getting some burnt cork, and I'm going into the next session blackface. Good idea. 
Only don't let me down because you're a white man. Mm.